Hey folks, welcome back to the Roswell UFO Conference, and as you know, we're working with the Roswell UFO Festival. The overcoat is off, the man in black stuff is off. This is the last of the four days of lectures with Mr. James Bartley coming up, and I just we're clocking out pretty soon after our panel discussion, which will be in here 3 o'clock beginning after this lecture. Give or take, you know how things are running, and we may have to redo the stage a little bit. But um, since, I'm, since I'm in this, on your way out of the convention center, this is our actual UFO Festival Committee shirt. And you would not believe, since last September, nine, ten months of people that have been putting, that already had full-time jobs, putting in first five or ten, then, then ten or twenty, thirty and more hours a week to make everything you've seen happen in Roswell happen. And even those things that didn't happen, we still put a lot of work into making them not happen. But anyway. <laughs> But when you see anybody in a purple shirt, give them a big hug, put a $100 bill in their pocket, whatever. Thank them because the mayor has done it in front of the press, the tireless, countless hours that everybody on the committee has put in. But we appreciate it. We've heard everything great about this. It's bigger than the 50th. You know, um, this is the best organized, most high-end, blah, 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 blah. And I, I didn't do all that. I got brought into this position in the last five or six weeks, but I've always been on the committee. You see a purple shirt, they need a hug. I'm just telling you. But with all that said, um, I didn't print an official bio for uh, Mr. Bartley, and you remember how we built it on the website until he arrived safely, which almost didn't happen. No lie, he can tell the story if he wishes. Um, we weren't even going to mention James Bartley's name, and that's plus we have a flair for the drama, and you fell for it. So, <laughs> because honestly, he's not anyone you've heard a lot of. But the program I do, live from Roswell.com, we were discussing my labs, military abductions, with Leah Haley one day. And she recommended get him on for the second portion of it, too, because I had not heard of him. But both uh, Leah Haley and Eve Lorgen told me, yeah, you're someone you want to talk to. We had a really incredible, mind-blowing discussion. And I knew the guy knew the field really well. I read a paper he did on it. And ever since that program, this is like my fourth program, I think, with Leah, we've been planning to have him here, but without publicizing his name. He definitely knows his stuff on the underside, the dark side of all of this stuff that has to do with the possibly military abductions, possibly New World Order conspiracies and all that. You, the title alone says enough for it, but I would just like you to welcome up someone that is not familiar to most of you, but his work is very solid, and uh, he actually knows how to give a presentation as well, Mr. James Bartley. Thank you very much for coming here. Can everyone hear me? This is truly a beautiful place, and I respect your understanding of the significance of this weekend. Uh, you could have been anywhere this weekend, but you chose to be here. And that tells me a lot about you. It tells me that you're a very intelligent crowd that really has an understanding of what's important. Now, the information I'm going to share with you today is very controversial. It's very... It's very negative, profoundly negative. But I will throw a bone out at the end and leave you with a happy message because I don't want you to leave here, you know, contemplating suicide or anything. But <laughs> the information I'm going to share is information that is not uh, common in the UFO community. M most of the other alien abduction researchers, for whatever reason, have deliberately left out a lot of this information, information relative to the reptilians, to military abductions and my labs for short. My labs are legitimate alien abductees who, for reasons which I will explain, are uh, kidnapped, trained, and utilized as deep black operatives by uh, elements of the military intelligence community. And this information has come with a price. There's many people I know, some who who've literally been killed, and some who've been harassed unmercifully, not just from human intelligence agencies, but from the reptilians and the aliens themselves. Any half-rate UFO researcher can be monitored or harassed by deep black elements of the human military intelligence community. However, when an, a, a researcher or an abductee starts getting harassed directly by the reptilians, for example, you, you know that that person is <coughs> crushed over into the threshold of the big leagues. And I will go into detail, uh, details about that in my talk. Now, before I delve into the speech, there are certain issues that I need to raise. 
one of which is the issue of credibility. For too long, uh, the American people have obtained their information about various and sundry subjects from patently non-credible sources. And just to give you a few examples, I I'd like to share from history uh, examples where the academic community, the scientific community, and establishment historians have all collaborated to, in effect, dumb down the public. Pearl Harbor conspiracies, JFK conspiracies, they're, they're still being maintained today because we're, the full truth about any of those subjects were to be revealed that would undermine other conspiracies that they are tangentially co connected to. Now, one of the problems I've always had is with people who are always trying to big shot me, people that are PhDs, people that are scientists, people that are members or former members of the aerospace community. They show up at these conferences, thump it on their chest like Tarzan. Here I am, big shot researcher. You have to listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. Time after time, in examples such as the MIA issue, missing prisoners of war, atomic veterans who've been used and utilized in radiation experiments or have taken part in uh, above ground atmospheric nuclear test, veterans of uh, the Southeast Asian conflict that were afflicted with uh, what's been known as uh, the Agent Orange syndrome from exposure to dioxin, and uh, most recently, Gulf War syndrome, which has come about through the use of uh, an anthrax vaccine. There's an excellent book about the subject called Vaccine A, written by someone named Matsumoto. And what all these subjects have in common is when these people that have been inflict afflicted with one sort of ailment or another has come forward to the, the VA department, to the rest of the medical scientific community, what has always happened without exception is that some establishment shill, some scientist, some academic always pops up and dismisses out of hand the claims of the, the sufferer of Agent Orange, uh, the sufferer of the radiation experiments, uh, the sufferer of the, the, the anthrax vaccine. There's a gigantic dung heap of these establishment shills that have sought to suppress and downplay and marginalize any information which contradicts the official spin. Most often is not, the excuse has been used of a psychological disorder, a psychological aberration on the part of veterans suffering from Gulf War syndrome, veterans suffering from Agent Orange exposure. Uh, things such as the deliberate uh, disappearance of uh, military records of some of these uh, individuals who've suffered from radiation exposure has, has been utilized. Now, it's interesting, when, Ro when Bob Lazar came forward with his astonishing claims about his work at S4, and it turned out that his, med his educational records couldn't be found, the debunkers all had a good laugh and said, well, he can't prove that he's a scientist. He can't prove he, he worked at Los Alamos. But that modus operandi has been used against people who've been exposed to radiation, who've been exposed to uh, dioxins from Agent Orange, who've been exposed in a number of other instances. It, it's, not a new, uh, it's not a new method of dealing with, with potential whistleblowers. There's a corporate financial agenda at work which, which strives to uh, attain global centralized control at the expense of the individual. So I want you to keep that in mind as I, I speak today because people are going to wonder about my credibility. People are going to wonder about the credibility of the abductees in my labs who share their information with me. And, and yet, for many years, these same people who are questioning the credibility of myself and my colleagues have bought into the lies of the establishment, have bought into the lies of the scientific community. And nowhere is that more prevalent than in the UFO field. 
For example, today is, is the age of the camcorder. You can't very well debunk and mock and ridicule a camcorder. So what happens? These experts in the aerospace field pop up, like so many pieces of feces which refuse to stay flushed. They pop up and they say, oh, well, that's just the stealth craft. And the, the dumb, ignorant audience, the national television audience, nods their head dumbly, yeah, stealth. But stealth, folks, has nothing to do with the visual spectrum. Stealth has everything to do with what's known as the radar cross-section, the RCS of, uh, of a craft, utilizing certain uh, composite materials, uh, designing the craft in such a way as there's no right angles to, to reflect back uh, radar signals. The radar cross-section can be reduced to such an extent that for all intents and purposes, it is invisible to radar. Not entirely invisible, but small enough to thwart any attempt at uh, ground control intercept radar stations, airborne radar lock-on uh, platforms to lock on to the craft. So when people say, well, oh, that, that uh, video shows like a stealth aircraft, that's just another lie. And they can only get away with that because the general public is ignorant about such issues. If it was a stealth aircraft, what is it doing lighting up the whole countryside? Doesn't that defeat the, pro uh, the whole purpose of stealth? I mean, think about it. It defeats the whole purpose of stealth. Now, um, and unless you're talking about the invisible jumbo jet that crashed in the Pentagon, that was equipped with a Romulan cloaking device. But the thing is, you always have these shills, and there's some here at this conference, UFO debunkers. Now, you can always tell who a UFO debunker is essentially a paid government liar. How do you know? Well, rule number one in counterintelligence psychological warfare operations is you have to have a plausible reason for being someplace. If you're, and by its very nature, a UFO debunker is a covert and deniable asset of the US government or some other government. But they have to have an explanation for being somewhere. This is like in overseas uh, operations. Uh, a person may have the cover of uh, uh, a, a, uh, Agency for uh, International Development. They could have the cover of a foreign service worker. They can have a cover of, of a relief uh, worker. A UFO debunker doesn't have a reason for being here. They don't have a reason why on their pretty websites they have Nothing but articles uh, debunking alien abductions, debunking U the UFO subject in general. So just keep all this in mind. I have to preface this because there are some people out there that still cling on to this notion that people with PhDs and other letters after their name uh, are somehow more credible than people who, who don't have those uh, letters after their name. So now that I got that out of the way, <coughs> you're probably wondering who I am. My name is James Bartley, and I've had somewhat of an eclectic background uh, in the telecommunications field and the insurance industry. I spent uh, a number of years as a civilian uh, working in an intelligence-related capacity for the Department of the Navy, in particular Naval Air Forces. My rather innocuous title was that of database coordinator. I worked in communications. One of the things that always struck me as humorous is all these experts with magnifying glasses poring over alleged official government documents, and they're saying, well, you know, the comma's out of place, so, well, the font is not right. Well, I, I really can't comment on how the formatting was years ago, but I know that today, really, uh, some of the official messages you will read from different commands can be as breezy and as irreverent as an email. Uh, they, they don't necessarily follow a particular uh, standard. Now, what did I do? Well, I really can't elaborate on what I did in communications because the powers that be are bound to determine to go to war with China and God knows how many other countries. But I will say that probably more than most in the intelligence community, I had uh, a extreme exposure to intelligence summaries from a multitude of intelligence agencies. Uh, 
ones that you're familiar with, maybe not so familiar with. Also, uh, R&D centers like the Army's Missile Development Center, Redstone Arsenal, uh, the various uh, intelligence sections of the, uh, the various commands, theater level commands, Army level commands, Air Force commands. When you're in communications, you are smack dab in the middle of, of just an astounding stream of intelligence-related information. Much of it really doesn't need to be classified, actually. Uh, on a daily basis, I interacted with members of the Naval Intelligence and Naval Security Group, which is Naval Security Group, or NAVSEC Group, is the naval subsidiary of the National Security Agency. I was responsible for creating entire streams of classified and unclassified message traffic, uh, what are known as AGS, A-I-G-S, uh, address indicator groups. Let me make one up. AG 555, it could be about aircraft maintenance. I was also responsible for creating what are known as CADs, collective address designators. And let me make one up. NASCAR. Anybody that had an interest in NASCAR from a crew standpoint, driver standpoint, or a racetrack standpoint, were all action or info addressees on these types of messages. Not only was I a member, uh, involved in communications, but I was the go-to guy in the command. If somebody in anti-submarine warfare needed a certain type of message traffic, they came to me. If somebody involved in electronic countermeasures, flying around in the EAB prowlers, they came to me. If somebody that worked at uh, a contractor working at one of the uh, uh, power propulsion desk, for whether it's uh, contractors from Pratt & Whitney, General Electric, what have you, they came to me. They came to me with the types of messages they needed to see. And I manipulated the database to ensure that they got those, those messages and nothing else. Nobody wants to see message traffic that's unrelated to their activity. I had carte blanche to visit any communications station, either onshore or uh, our particular interest was with the, the, the carrier battle, battle groups as well as the uh, affiliated naval air stations. So. Within our region, I had carte blanche to visit any communication station. By the time I left, my clearance was being upgraded to a crypto level, and I would have been the go-to guy. I would have been in charge of running a standalone uh, communication system for our three-star admiral, what's known as a type command, uh, our three-star admiral in charge of all naval aviation activities in the Persian Gulf, uh, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. But I, you know, I chose not to stick around. I resigned. Uh, on top of that, I'm a student of military history with an emphasis on intelligence, counterintelligence, and special operations. I'm also a student of the American Civil War. So unlike most people in the military who I find to be astonishingly ignorant about the history of this country and the history of even um, their particular military activity, I was sort of well-rounded. I, I understood the significance of what it was I was reading. I understood, I understood the history of what it was I, was I was reading. So that's just a bit about me. And one other thing that you need to know about me is that I am an alien abductee. I've had numerous encounters with reptilians, with what are known as the reptilian greys. Uh, you always hear about the ubiquitous gray beings. Well, the beings that I had encounters with in full waking consciousness were what are known as reptilian greys, what the late, great Dr. Carla Turner referred to as the chicken claws. They don't have a long finger and a long nail. They just have claws. And when you wake up and then you find yourself surrounded by three of these things with claws and they're looking down at you, believe me, that can be a pretty traumatic experience. Uh, so I know wherein I speak. When I speak about alien abductions and particularly encounters with reptilians, I can develop an instant kinship and understanding with others who have experienced the same things. My colleagues and I have always taken the approach of being friends first, researchers later, because people will only open up to you if they know that you have a vested emotional interest in them. Too often, researchers use the information from an abductee or someone who's a, you know, had anomalous experiences, and then after their book is written, they discard them. They become just baggage. Well, we don't do that. What we do is we, we work long-term with the people we're involved with. 
My mentor is Barbara Bartholik, in my opinion, the greatest alien abduction researcher on this planet. She has had a number of protégés, some of them you may have heard of, the late, great Dr. Carla Turner, candy to her friends. Uh, Jim Walden, he, he uh, co-wrote a book uh, with Barbara Bartholik. She helped substantially in the creation of his book. He writes about his own experiences as, for all intents and purposes, a host of a reptilian entity, an interdimensional reptilian entity, which I will explain the mechanics behind that in a moment. Eve Lorgan, Evelyn Lorgan, is a close colleague of mine who has uh, studied at the feet of Barbara Bartholik, in particular the subject of what, are known as, what is known as the alien love bite. Now this may seem somewhat comical to, to those who don't know any better, but, and I will elaborate on this more, but we are emitters, we are resonators. And what some of these negative beings strive to do is engender negative emotions and feelings within us of anguish, of pain, of misery, of isolation and hopelessness. What the alien love bite is, 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 what it is it's a setting up of a, of a love bonding drama between, between two abductees, oftentimes bonded from childhood, where they're abducted and re-abducted, and as they grow older, uh, oftentimes not knowing of the existence of the other, they've already developed strong astral connections and strong subconscious connections, and then decades later, uh, Jack and Jill, let's say, meet at a, a UFO conference, very common, and then an instant chemistry, an instant bond between them develops, where they feel that they've had sexual relations with one another. They have extreme close body, like uh, chemical reactions with one another. They begin to psychically develop uh, uh, communication with each other. And then one of the outcomes of that is that an emotional unplugging occurs where one is left in an unrequited state because they can't consummate the relationship because they may be married. But the bottom line, the reason for this is to engender extreme emotions of uh, misery, unhappiness, unrequited love. And these beings, they feed off that. They feed off that in the way you or I nurture ourselves on, on food or protein or what have you. These beings literally strive to create n negative situations in our life for a number of reasons, but mostly to feed off of us. Now, there are four subjects I will discuss today. In general, I'm here to talk about the reptilian overlordship. The reptilian overlordship, the proof of which is all around us. The global institutionalized sex slavery, the, uh, the wars and the rumors of wars, the designer plagues, uh, all of these things are part and parcel uh, the, the rapidly advancing uh, movement towards global centralized control, uh, the privatization of water, uh, genetically modified foods. All these things are part and parcel of the reptilian overlordship. They are around us. We, we see this all the time. But people just don't realize that there is a controlling factor behind all of it. Uh, the tendency on the part of some conspiracy researchers is to ascribe all, all these activities uh, on the part of power-mad bankers, power-mad humans. But uh, I promise you that the, uh, not only the conception, but the execution of this uh, advancing global, globalized, centralized agenda was thousands of years in the making, and, uh, and a purely human consciousness cannot conceive of, let alone affect these changes. Because if you have any understanding of, of metaphysics at all, you will know that Everything manifests first in the spiritual realms before they manifest in the physical realms. That's just the way it is. A simple thought followed by an action is, is just a, one very basic example. How else is the reptilian overlordship manifested to us? Oh, vulgarity, extreme vulgarity. Uh, movies like Jackass are, are, have become hits. Um, uh, all these efforts at promoting vulgarity as the norm in our society. Uh, the occultic symbology, my friend Jordan Maxwell out there in, in the convention hall, he is the foremost expert on, the occultic, on occultic symbology and he's had his information borrowed and stolen constantly. In fact, uh, the Tom Hanks character in the movie Da Vinci Code is a pale imitation of, of Jordan Maxwell. And you see the symbol, symbology when you walk down the aisles of a supermarket. Uh, every time you see a 
obelisk, you're looking at a representation of a reptilian phallus. Uh, in other words, they're just sticking it to you and you don't even realize it. It's there in front of you. Okay? That's the reptilian overlordship in a nutshell, which I'll elaborate on more later. The four aspects of the reptilian overlordship I will talk about are one, the reptilians and their modus operandi. Two, the hybrid hosting process, which is the fundamental building block, the fundamental basis for the reptilian overlordship. Three, my labs, which are legitimate alien abductees who have uh, been utilized by deep black elements of the military intelligence community as covert operatives because of innate abilities they have, paraphysical abilities. Um, all abductees are part of a, a particular bloodlines and many of these my labs have latent paraphysical capabilities because, precisely because they've been utilized and uh, genetically modified and upgraded, if you will, by various and sundry alien groups, particularly the reptilians. And the fourth thing I will talk about, I will, I will tie up all those three subjects at the end. Now, the first thing I will talk about is the reptilians. There are essentially two types of reptilians. There's the spacefaring reptilians. They literally fly around in spaceships. And then there are the, what's been described as the inner terrestrials uh, that live within the Earth that are essentially native to this planet. They've been here as long as or longer than we have. And these beings have uh, developed over time an interdimensional capability. They are masters of frequency and resonance. They can alter their, des their density. The reptilians have attained control of the surface through a mastery of genetics, through control of the human gene pool, modifying the human race in general and particular bloodlines in particular to the point where they develop attributes, behaviors, and capabilities which advance the reptilian agenda on the surface. The reptilians come in a number of different shapes and sizes. Some are rather small, four to four and a half to five feet tall. More commonly, they're six feet tall and, and taller. Some as high as seven, seven and a half feet tall. They can be a number of colors, like dark green. Uh, they can be brownish what's been described as pea soup green. There's a particular type of reptilian species we refer to as the yellow bellies. There are many reptile-type reptile species on the surface, like crocodiles and alligators that have a tannish or a whitish underside. There are literally reptilians that have a whitish or a tannish underside. We call them yellow bellies. And these reptilians, over time, have developed the ability to, like I said, they can alter their, their density. Now, how do they interact with the humans? Well, let's start with how reptilians interact with females, human females. Now, most of these human females that have encounters with reptilians are in all likelihood uh, reptilian hybrids to a degree themselves. I refer to them as reptilian familiars familiar in the family sense, the generational sense. These reptilians will follow certain bloodlines generation after generation. And when a woman is having encounters with reptilians, it's because she's been genetically modified to the point where she is suitable uh, for a reptilian to access for purposes of, of mating or, or what have you. Now, how does a reptilian rape a human woman? Let's say a woman is sleeping at night. What the reptilian can do is it can appear, and sometimes she may not be able to see the, uh, the creature. Uh, they can be invisible in the visible spectrum. But you can see the depression of weight that the reptilian is leaving. For example, you can see a depression of weight on, on a mattress, on a sofa, on the carpet but you cannot see the reptilian itself. It may choose not to allow you to see it. And what the woman may feel is a sudden pressure on her chest, or if she's laying on her stomach, a sudden pressure on her back. And what will happen is, is oftentimes the reptilian will sexually assault the human woman. And 
let's say the woman is lying on her back and the reptilian assaults her but is invisible. She will not be able to see what is going on. Although she will feel the, uh, the thrusting action of, of the reptilian's member. Let's say, for example, that she can move her arms or she can move her hands. She may try to block or prevent uh, the organ of the reptilian from entering her. She, she, but she will not feel anything, but she'll try. Paradoxically, she will still feel the insertion of the reptilian's member into one or the other orifices. So it's somewhat of a paradox. It's like, well, she can't block it with her hand, but she still feels it, you know, thrusting inside of her. I should have added in my preface that this is kind of adult content, so, you know. Um, but I really do believe that there, if there are members of the audience that are somewhat young and whose parents or mother is having these experiences, I mean, now is as good a time as any to learn. So you have something of a paradox where the reptilian can penetrate layers of bed clothes, of bed sheets, linen, bed clothes, and s densify particular parts of its anatomy, like its member or its claws, for example, and still remain invisible. Now, what the reptilian can also do is it can assume the guise of someone that the woman is attracted to or has been involved with in the past. A reptilian can appear as an ex-boyfriend or someone the gal just got a crush with, someone that she runs into the laundromat, you know, at the apartment complex. The reptilian can appear as that particular person. Or, conversely, if the reptilian wants to engender as much fear and terror from the uh, abductee, it can allow itself, it, it could reveal itself in its full reptilian glory, if you will. And if you haven't seen a sketch of a reptilian, if you haven't seen a reptilian in person, snout, uh, big eyes, sometimes yellowish, sometimes reddish, vertical slit pupils, uh, sometimes big flaring nostrils, uh, rows of sharp teeth, extremely robust claws. And what the reptilian can also do, if it really wants to uh, create terror within the abductee, is not only can it allow itself to be seen, but the reptilians, and also, as I will describe later, reptilian-human hybrids, uh, for all intents and purposes, humans that have reptilian capabilities. Reptilians and human-reptilian hybrids, some of them, have the ability to somehow trigger within the mind or the brain of the abductee specific memories of previous child abuse, previous sexual abuse. So the reptilian can trigger that part of the mind of, of the abductee and she will begin to remember a sexual assault when she was a child or a time when she was raped. And not only that though, but what a number of researchers into satanic ritual abuse and um, mind control have, have discovered is that uh, energy is locked into the bodies of, of ritual abuse and mind control victims. It's, it's locked into the bodies and it's, it's blocked and it's uh, incapable of getting out. What the reptilians can do is cause not only the memories of the childhood sexual assault to flood into the mind of the person and force them to relive that sexual assault in real time, but the attendant body memories also can be made to surface. So it causes the abductee, the woman, to uh, freeze up, become petrified and terrified, and all the while the reptilian feeds off of this. Now, one of the byproducts of a reptilian sexual assault, well, there are a number of them where the woman is concerned. Uh, one of them is, is extremely heightened libido. And the reason for this is because the reptilian has the ability to activate the, what's known as the kundalini, uh, the chi, the sexual energy uh, of the woman, and cause her to have ex what's been described to me as extremely powerful full body orgasms from the t tips of the toes all the way to the head, just leaving them breathless. 
And this could last literally for hours. Now, there are some consequences to that. And I'm not trying to make light of it. This is just a facet of it that is very real. Where the woman can feel intense shame about what has been going on. Because nobody wants to admit, even to themselves, that they're having these sexual assaults from a reptilian creature. But at the same time, the force and the power of the orgasms are such that after a while, she begins to wonder when the entity will come back. She begins to, to long for that feeling again. And, and this creates a cycle of guilt and shame. Another byproduct of these sexual assaults is that the female abductee, for a short period of time after the sexual assault, will be extremely psychic. In fact, I know of a case, a female, a close friend of mine, who's had a number of reptilian experiences and a number of military experiences. A reptilian came into her house, sexually assaulted her, and no sooner did the reptilian leave that the military, through some means which we haven't quite figured out, they have the means to pull in uh, the MyLabs that they're working with from their house straight to their realm through some kind of teleportation device, some kind of portal. We don't really know the mechanics behind it, but they just have a means of taking someone and then just pulling them to some other location, frequently an underground installation. So no sooner had this reptilian raped her and departed than the military pulled her in into the underground base and immediately set her to work on a remote viewing operation uh, in the Persian Gulf area. So that tells me one of, two th uh, one of two things. One, the military, knowing that this woman is a reptilian hybrid and has had a lifetime experience as reptilians, monitored her household. They have sensors that are sensitive, sensitive enough to indicate when a reptilian manifests. And there is an energetic um, spike when a reptilian manifests because they don't need spaceships to travel around in. They can open up a portal in your wall walk right through. They, very often, you hear stories of them coming out of closets. That's a very common um, point of entry for reptilians and other beings, where they create a portal entry and they come in through a closet. Ch you know, children's boogeyman stories uh, are frequently talk about boogeyman and monsters coming out of closets. As I was going to discuss later, Ted Bundy, uh, the infamous serial killer, complained about scaly creatures coming out of his closet when he was a child. So what does that tell me? It tells me that the military was either monitoring the, the woman, knew a reptilian to come, had sexually assaulted her, and decided to exploit that circumstance and use her in a remote viewing operation. Or it's possible that the reptilian and, and the military were working in cahoots. And the reptilian came in first, did its thing, and then the military took her and utilized her in, the, in this operation. We, we know these things have happened because more than one person has described this kind of experience. Some of the other things that reptilians do to uh, women is they can literally take over the body of a woman while the woman is having sex with a partner. And then what the woman describes is something similar to um, astral body, out-of-body experiences, where her consciousness will leave her physical body, and this reptilian will then come in and then engage in intercourse with her partner. And oftentimes, the entity taking over uh, the woman's body uh, can get into all kinds of real sordid kink. It can get into all kinds of perverted activities and the woman is just out of her body just watching this saying that's not me I wouldn't do any of those things um, so that's uh, also been reported that they can take over the consciousness uh, the body of a person while they're having intercourse later on I will explain some of the mechanics and dynamics as far as the hybrid hosting process uh, for now just keep in mind that there are some psychics have the ability when they look at a person, whether they're on TV, um, out in public, they can literally see a reptilian entity overshadowing the, uh, the person. Uh, we call that person a host because they're wittingly or unwittingly 
hosting a, a reptilian entity. So keep that point in mind. It's, it's very important. One of the things that the reptilians also do to women is they, like I said before, they strive to create as much pain and anguish within the people. Uh, this could be for male abductees as well. A very common tactic that the reptilians do is they contrive to create a lower back injury. And what this does is it, it, it causes that abductee to not only feel physical anguish and physical pain, but emit that energy, uh, emit emotions and energy of suffering, of pain, anguish, and hopelessness. They, what the reptilians do is they develop strongholds within us. One inevitable byproduct of, of a lot of these experiences is the abductee will resort to self-medication. I can speak from experience because when I was in high school, I had a lot of abduction experiences. And I know if I had a choice of laying there in bed, and when I was a kid it was extreme, I'd be, be laying beneath a veritable mountain of, of pillows and, and blankets and stuff with the lights turned on, okay, because I was scared. I didn't know why I was scared. But as I got older uh, in high school, I still didn't realize what was going on, although I was having a lot of experiences. But I knew that if I had a choice of laying in bed, frightened uh, at some nameless fear, or getting drunk and laying there in the room spitting around, I always usually opted for the latter. I'd rather <laughs> get buzzed out and not worry about it. So addictions, uh, you know, people shouldn't be judged on the fact that they resort to self-medication. It's only because they don't know what's happening or it's a, it's a stress reliever. The reptilians strive to create compulsive behaviors within us. Uh, they strive to create uh, self-destructive behaviors with us, whether it's addictions, compulsive behaviors, uh, other self-destructive activities, uh, sexual addictions, whatever the case may be. Because all of these things can be utilized by the reptilian to control the person. Isolation and the feelings of isolation is a very effective control mechanism that the reptilians uh, and aliens in general utilize on people. For example, if a woman is having these experiences, but her husband or her significant other is extremely negative about the subject, that tends to make the woman feel even more isolated, even more helpless, even more alone. The ETs and the reptilians will literally manipulate and program her spouse or significant other to uh, even become agitated or angry when the subject comes up. So the end result of that is it, it pulls out uh, one possible source of emotional support uh, for the woman undergoing these experiences. And you know we can see the opposite happening with, with males going through experiences and, and the people around them being extremely negative. I was once punched out by my ex-brother-in-law, who um, I believe, I call him a closet case abductee, just based on the experiences he's had and the things he's described to me. I know he's had abductions, but uh, one time, I guess I, I punched one of his wrong buttons, bringing the subject up, because he just hauled off and slugged me, and we got into a good fight. But that's, that's just an example you know, of, um, of a control mechanism. And one thing that you should also realize, too, is as abductees, and I know I'm talking to some of you in the audience, certain types of programming is instilled within, within many abductees to make them uh, become agitated when they hear this information, to make them fall asleep or become sleepy or drowsy. Many times I've been giving lectures and I look over and someone's just conked out because, um, because the information is such that it triggers uh, a built-in response for the person to fall asleep so they don't hear the information. Other uh, trigger mechanisms are uh, becoming agitated. Uh, suddenly the overwhelming compulsion to get up and smoke a cigarette, uh, the overwhelming compulsion to get up and simply leave. All of these things help to keep that abductee isolated and uh, ignorant of information that may help them. One of the more controversial aspects of the reptilian uh, abduction agenda 
is what is known as the crank program. The ETs and the reptilians create certain programs. There's what's been described as the Palladian New Age la da program where you come across blonde haired women who believe that they're Palladian hybrid walk-ins but they're really just having horrendous reptilian experiences but, but they don't realize it because the programming and manipulation is such that they only are allowed to remember uh, pleasant experiences, feel-good experiences. Uh, then there are other programs such as the crank program. The foremost pioneer in this facet of the reptilian research is my mentor, Barbara Bartholik. Now, most of you are familiar with the problem of crystal meth, also and a derivative known as crank. But many of you may not realize that it is part and parcel of the reptilian abduction agenda. Uh, a colleague of mine I haven't spoken to in a long time is a guy named George Andrews. And he wrote, uh, he put together, compiled a book uh, called Drugs and Magic, which uh, is a synopsis of shamanic uh, practices around the world, different cultures, where dr drugs are utilized in order to uh, expand one's consciousness and to be able to interact and commune with non-human beings, very often interdimensional beings, but sometimes uh, more corporeal beings. Drugs and Magic, if you can find that book, uh, please get it. What the reptilians have done is, through their control of the rep human reptilian hybrids here on the surface, they have created this crank crystal meth pandemic. The reptilians resonate at a sympathetic frequency with crystal meth and crank. If you've studied the, the police blotters and, and the crime histories of people who are on crystal meth and crank, you will find certain commonalities. One, they are prone to like mayhem and berserk, uh, sadistic, violent behavior. If you really peer closely, you'll find that many crank users uh, are into uh, perverse, um, outrageous sexual practices, including pedophilism and what have you. Because what the crank and crystal meth does is it affects the, the brain chemistry of the, of the person using the drug. Now, I should mention that many people that are reptilian hybrids or hosts have a genetic predisposition to hosting or, be, or because of the long-term genetic manipulation. But someone who is a crank user or a crystal meth user needn't have that genetic predisposition. Uh, crank use is a fast track to getting possessed, not only by reptilians, but by demonic entities in general. What... Uh, the, the spouses and the significant others, the girlfriends of, of crank users have described is that when their husband or their boyfriend goes into a crank-induced rage, literally sometimes they're like a reptilian lizard-like um, image just suddenly comes over their face, like overshadows their face. Sometimes their, their pupils go vertical. Uh, sometimes it manifests in, in other ways, such as uh, a fascination, uh, with more perverse, kinky sex, for example. My mentor, Barbara Barthwick, had spoken to a, a headhunter uh, in the semiconductor industry in Silicon Valley. This guy was a computer scientist, and his job was to recruit uh, software engineers, software designers in Silicon Valley. As such, he was privy to all kinds of interesting information, including plans to microchip the entire population, but that's another story. <laughs> what this guy experienced from prolonged crank use was that, and he was an extremely sharp individual. I listened to the audio tape of, of Barbara's uh, interview with him. What he described is it got to the point where his paranoia uh, was such that the, the ETs and the reptilians no longer bothered to conceal themselves. They would like flit in and out of reality constantly at all times. Uh, it could be at home, it could be driving his car, it could be at the workplace. They would just pop up because, like I said, the reptilians have a sympathetic frequency to, to the drug crank and crystal methadrine. Long-term users begin to resonate at that frequency. And it allows the entities to what I call interface with that person. And, and as time goes on, uh, this guy, I think his name was Chris, 
he began having more and more perverse thoughts. It got to the point where the moment he got home from work in the Silicon Valley job, he would get, he would get right uh, online onto the computer and start going to the child pornography sites. He, he couldn't help it. And uh, he realized that he had a problem. And the reason he, he, he got a hold of Barbara was my, my, call, my, my mentor was giving a radio interview and he happened to be one of the listeners. And he contacted Barbara through the, the radio program. And another interesting thing that Chris said was he eventually attended a, a crystal meth support group, like a 12-step group for crystal meth and crank users. And privately, amongst themselves, probably not to the counselors because they always lie to them, but amongst themselves, just about every single other crystal meth and crank user described a similar outcome where they were compelled to go to the child pornography sites, compelled to, to get involved in that kind of um, entertainment, if you will. So what it shows is it, it al the crank allows these negative intelligences to take over a human body, sometimes temporarily, sometimes permanently. And it, it provides them a medium through which to affect changes here on the surface. There was a case in San Diego, I lived, I lived there for many years, where uh, in what we call East County, there was a, a crankster couple, Hispanic couple. They were uh, babysitting the, uh, the, the niece, uh, the woman's niece. And the child was suffering from prolonged abuse from this couple. Finally, it got to the point where they filled up a bathtub with scalding hot water, and then they dropped the baby into it. It was, it was a toddler. And then the skin literally melted off the, the child. It was horrible. I saw uh, on TV they brought the couple in to court for an arraignment. And you could just see, looking in their eyes, it's like you know, lights are on, but nobody's home. It's because they had become possessed and taken over. There are countless examples of this. I have a female abductee, my lab friend, who works in a state hospital, essentially an asylum for violent criminals in, in California. And what the counselors are told over and over again by long-term crank and crystal meth users is they hear voices in their heads. These voices tell them to do things. These voices tell them to, to harm themselves and harm others. I mean, it's such a common thing that it's taken for granted. And let me tell you a story about a personal friend of mine. This guy was a reptilian hybrid through and through. He was really into the gonzo films where um, women would be, you know, slapped and abused and carried around in briefcases. Uh, that sort of uh, uh, emblematic of the reptilian mindset. You see... One thing you have to understand about the reptilians is they have this concept of human ownership. The reptilians have a concept of human ownership which manifests across the board um, from, from the literal standpoint of hosting and taking over somebody to um, organizing global institutionalized sex slavery. All across the board, the reptilians have this concept of human ownership. And this is manifested this is manifested in uh, a lot of these so-called porn films where you know, women are abused and women are carried around in briefcases like, like they're cattle or, 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 or toys. That's another facet, facet of the reptilian overlordship is, is the diminution and the marginalization of the feminine principle. Women and children are prey to the reptilians and the reptilian hybrids who, through genetic manipulation, have risen to positions of power here on the surface. And I was warning Joe about all of them. I shouldn't say his name, sorry. Let's call him Phil. I said, I was warning Phil about this. I said, listen, man, you've got all the horrible hallmarks. You've had all these ex experiences and abductions. And, you know, you're, you're borderline. You've got to watch it. You know what I mean? You've got to avoid watching these kinds of videos because it's going to really do a number on your mind. Well, well, Phil was also a crankster. And he went off on a week-long binge of crank. Um, and... The end result of which, when he came down, when it got to the point where he was physically incapable of ingesting any more crank, uh, he kind of uh, was in the process of coming down in a completely paranoid, delusional state of mind, during which 
he told me that he left his body, he shot up into the sky, he came down in a, in a place that he believed to be somewhere in Los Angeles. He, went, he came down into the body of a man in an alleyway. And the moment he got into the body of that, that man, he lunged after and he strangled to death the first woman that, that happened to be around. So after prolonged crank use, he exits his body, comes down into, what, into a man, and he just immediately goes and assaults a woman and presumably kills her. And the way he was describing the experience, it was like he was like reliving the experience. Some of these guys that are reptilian hybrids that have this, um, this aspect of dominance over females and sadomasochism and, and dominance and submission, when you hear them talk about women, you can, it, uh, red flags pop up. Like when I see a great looking gal, wow, she's a great looking gal, right? Look at her eyes. Now, someone who's like a reptilian hybrid, full on reptilian hybrid, their reaction is entirely different. Hey, yeah, you see that chick? She was a great looking gal, wasn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I saw her. God, what I would do to her. You see the difference? You see the mindset where another guy could look at a gal and have this, well, aesthetic beauty. Look at her. God's creation. Someone else who's a hybrid with this reptilian concept of human ownership, what I'd do with her. You know, it, it, it's a different mindset. But you have to be aware of that, you gals especially. Uh, these reptilians and the, the, the humans they work through, they can be very charismatic, they can be very charming, uh, but I really believe that a lot of times the reason some of you gals are seemingly addicted to negative abusive guys is, is because of the reptilian uh, hybrid male's ability to manipulate your kundalini. Uh, a reptilian human hybrid has the ability to astral travel at will. They can astrally rape people. Like some of you gals meet some guy here, and then like a week or a few days later, he starts coming into your dreams and having intercourse with you. That's very common. I call them um, astral rape toids. And the ones who do this repetitively, I call serial rape toids. It is an innate capability that reptilian human hybrids have. Not all of them, some of them. Because some of them are literally coached and, and taught how to do this by their reptilian familiars. They will, can see into these other dimensions. and I mean, you would see nobody around them, but they can see reptilians around them. And they will teach these hybrids to do these things. So a lot of times, you gals, if you get like, involved with a, like a really negative, abusive guy, uh, chances are he's probably one of these reptilian human hybrids. A reptilian human hybrid has the ability to uh, stimulate a woman from across the table or across the room. He has the ability. And, and the woman will just think, wow, chemistry, things are really flowing between us. It's like that's an ability, a latent ability that that person has. So just be aware of it. They're everywhere. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. Um, some of the um, uh, byproducts that female abductees have, um, how much time do I got left? Um, half an hour. OK. I'll really give you the hardcore stuff now. I'm just getting warmed up. Um, some of the uh, byproducts that uh, women experience that have these reptilian experiences are, uh, like I said, a heightened libido for a short, you know, certain period of time. But also, their olfactory senses can be manipulated by the reptilian. Many of these reptilians are very possessive of their human female abductees. They don't want anyone, not even a human boyfriend, a human male, having anything to do with this woman. Again, it's that reptilian concept of human ownership. I've known of boyfriends who've been attacked by reptilians. Guys in the shower, you know, taking a shower, and the next thing you know, a reptilian pops up, claws him, right? It's because he's, the boyfriend is involved with what the reptilian believes is, is its mate. So one of the ways the reptilian gets around that is it manipulates the olfactory senses of the female abductee to the point where she's repulsed by male human pheromones. She just can't stand the smell of them, doesn't want to be around any humans at all, uh, human males, rather. Now, conversely, what, the, what can happen to uh, human uh, females that have reptilian experiences, the reptilians 
it could be a part of the agenda where they want the woman to have other partners. In fact, sometimes have frequent partners. It's not unusual for women that are having these experiences uh, through no fault of their own, and there's no shame attached, but sometimes they become very promiscuous. And not surprising considering what's been going on. So what the reptilians can do, because like I said, they feed off the energy of, of people having sexual intercourse. They can manipulate the, uh, the scent of the human female to the point where she becomes irresistible to all human males. She can go to the store, the supermarket checkout, and like, you know, the cashier, the, you know, the bagger boy, they're all just sniffing her and they're just all become enamored with her instantly. This could last for days and weeks where everywhere she goes, everyone just falls in love with her. Uh, this bespeaks an extraordinary understanding and control of the humans uh, by the reptilians and other aliens. It, it means that they have a thorough understanding of our physiology, of our neurology. Barbara Barthelick and I always laugh at all these efforts at all, all these UFO groups. We're going to gain contact with the ETs. We're, we're going to form a UFO group and we're going to, you know, form a contact group. Well, obviously from what I've been telling you that the ETs and the reptilians have already come in contact with us. So it's, it's, it's academic to try to form a group to make contact with the ETs. They've been contacting us. They've been manipulating us. It's always been like that. Now, I've told you a bit about how reptilians operate as far as um, a vis-a-vis -vis human woman. Let me talk to you a bit about how reptilians will create a serial murderer. As, again, the reptilians have attained control of the surface through the manipulation and control of the human gene pool, um, imbuing certain characteristics and behaviors within human hybrids uh, that will advance their agenda, both on a family scale and a societal global scale. What the reptilians do with, with a male reptilian hybrid is gradually over a period of time, they, will, they can turn that person into a pedophile or a serial murderer. Uh, or they can even change the sexual orientation uh, of, of a given abductee. Now, please don't hear what I didn't say. I didn't say that the reptilians, a gay person is gay because the reptilians made him gay. No. In some cases, though, as I will point out in a moment, the reptilians can manipulate someone sexually, physically, and so forth, and cause them to not only change their orientation, but in extreme cases also to to have a sex change operation. Barbara Barthelig has worked with a number of guys who, over a period of time, eventually changed sexes. Now, how is this done? Now, the reptilians hold a tactical high ground. And the reason for that is we have to sleep. Whereas reptilians operate, in, for all intents and purposes, a timeless realm. Many of them are interdimensional in nature. What a reptilian will do to a male, in our example, is the reptilian will enter into the body of a male and quickly take over his astral dreamscape. The reptilian will eroticize the dreamscape, pervert the dreamscape. Let me give you an example. The guy finds himself in a dream. He's walking around in, a, in, a, in an empty household. No furniture. He's walking around wondering what he's doing there, what's going on. He walks into a room and suddenly he sees a gal like um, sitting on uh, a recliner, uh, an easy chair. And then she suddenly uh, poses in such a way that is sexually provocative. He immediately gets the impression that she wants to have intercourse with him. So like most Randy males, he positions himself in such a way as to engage in intercourse with her. The moment he, in the dream, remember, the reptilian is inside of his body, his uh, ethereal body of a reptilian, has penetrated a sleeping human, has taken over the astral dreamscape. And now the guy is at the point where he's about to engage in intercourse with the woman. And the moment he um, initiates intercourse, the reptilian sodomizes him from behind. And very often at the same time that he 
initiates intercourse with a, with a dream woman, not only does he get sodomized from behind, but the object of his desires morphs, shapeshifts into something entirely repulsive. It turns into his sister, his daughter, into a hermaphroditic type being, uh, characteristics of both sexes. He wakes up, oh my God, right? He's feeling this icky tingly body, uh, icky tingly sensation all over his body, from, from his toes all the way to the top of his head. What's happening is that's the entity. He's feeling the entity. And then he may see like a dark shadow, a dark cloud above him. And then the gr entity will gradually start to leave his body. And he will f that will manifest in the form of this icky, tingly feeling uh, in his arms, back of his um, you know, neck, and what have you. He thinks nothing of it. It's just some weird, weird dream. He shunts off the experience in that back shelf label, don't worry about it, too weird. Let's say the next night or two nights later, he has a similar dream. He's about to engage in intercourse with another dream lover. And the moment he begins to initiate intercourse, once again, he's sodomized from behind. And once again, the entity may, uh, the person he's about to have sex with, shapeshift into something that he's totally repulsed by. Now, you can imagine if this process continues for days and weeks, sometimes months, is it any surprise that the guy develops a sexual dysfunction? Is it any surprise that the guy develops erectile uh, dysfunction? Uh, for, because in his mind, he's made a cognitive association between heterosexual sex on the one hand and extreme rectal pain on the other, and, and like all these fears of horror and shame in between. Now, there are variations of this. Uh, sometimes he will find himself with... Uh, a gal who's the object of his dreams, and he may not be sodomized, but uh, what'll happen is, see, there's a parallel physical, sexual, paraphysical manipulation that's going on with, uh, within the, the human. The reptilian is manipulating him at all these different levels, you know, psychologically, sexually, physically. For example, he may have an exp uh, a dreamscape experience where he's just surrounded with extraordinarily beautiful women all, who all want to have sex with him. And, you know, he'll look down and he's, you know, suitably feeling randy. And uh, he'll, he may be hugging or caressing a woman. Next thing you know, that, that woman shapeshifts into a little child. And then the voice in his head, which is the reptilian, is telling him, go ahead. Now, he's already excited. He's already fully aroused from what happened moments before. But now, instead of a, a beautiful woman in his arms, it's a small child. It could be his own daughter. And the message in his mind is, go ahead. Nobody's going to know. Go ahead and do it. You want to do it, don't you? Okay, now, let's expand upon that further. As I said earlier, Ted Bundy was one of many um, people. Did this thing turn off or what? That's a 95, by the way, see? Oh, well, the point I'm making is there are physical characteristics which are common amongst reptilian hybrids and serial murderers and pedophiles in particular. You always hear, okay, you always hear these, oh, shoot, modern technology. You always hear these FBI profilers and these psychologists saying that, oh, serial murder, there's no way you can, Tell, the, tell who they are. They, all, they look like everybody else. Complete nonsense. Okay, there's a phys there are notable physical characteristics. Andre Ch Ch Chikatilo, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Now, take a look at the features, okay? Hooded eyelids. Very often a pronounced brow above the, uh, above the eyebrows. Uh, high set cheekbones. Very often... Um, eyes sunk deep in the eye sockets, okay? Now, who was Andre Chikatilo? Well, he just, dev he killed upwards of 300 children in Moscow, devoured many of them, okay? Now, I'm running out of time here, but th th there's something you have to understand. The reptilian overlordship and the reptilian control of the human gene pool make such horrors as the institutionalized global sex slavery, um, satanic rituals, uh, what goes on at the Bohemian Grove, and so on and so forth, it makes it understandable. 
Because during these, like satanic rituals, for example, uh, these human reptilian hybrids, uh, they're having intercourse. They're having sex orgies with decapitated bodies and disembodied, bo disemboweled bodies laying around. Now, to you or I, that's extraordinarily repulsive and horrifying. But to them, it's, it's exactly the opposite. Reptilian human hybrids and serial killers in particular, they get off on inflicting sadistic pain onto others. It's part of the, human con the reptilian concept of human ownership. They get off on inflicting pain. They get off on, on torturing and, and killing. Ted Bundy, I'll show a picture of him if I get this mouse working. Um, Ted Bundy, not, he, he would be strangling, oh, that's John Wayne Gacy. Well, since I got him up, let me tell you a story. You're probably familiar with his story. Look at, once again, hooded eyelids. Um, in some pictures, you'll see a more pronounced brow, uh, a ridge over his eyebrows. Uh, high set cheekbones. He used to kill and murder little boys and bury them in his, in his, underneath his living room in his house in Chicago. Well, there was a kid who had a very unusual, bizarre um, pastime. His name was Jason Moss, and he wrote a book called The Last Victim. And Jason Moss used to become pen pals with serial killers like John Wayne Gacy and uh, Richard Ramirez and Jeffrey Dahmer. Now, he, Jason Moss actually got to visit John Wayne Gacy in his prison cell. Now, keep in mind that that was probably the first time John Wayne Gacy had been in the, alone with a young boy, a teenager, since he was doing all the murders. Up to that point in prison, Gacy was only... The only male contact he had was with his lawyer, prison guards, what have you. Well, anyway, Jason Moss, a stupid kid, goes and sees him in the prison cell. The moment he was alone with, uh, with Richard, uh, John Wayne Gacy, Gacy switched. And he, th he started approaching uh, Jason Moss and said, I'm going to bend you over, F you in your, your ass, and your blood's going to just leak all over the place, right? And he began reaching down, fondling himself. John Wayne Gacy was fondling himself. Guess what? Nothing. Because he's dysfunctional. He's impotent. So some of the things that I mentioned earlier, some of the dynamics involved, were perfectly exemplified in his case, where the first time he'd ever been around a young boy since all his murders, he switches. And he, you have to understand also that these reptilian human hybrids, they equate sexual gratification with inflicting pain and torture on others. It's all intermeshed with them, okay? And the psychologists bend over backwards to say, oh, it's just a psychological aberration, it's just a psychological disorder. No, there's a genetic basis for it. And some, some FBI profilers are starting to catch on to that. Okay, Richard Ramirez, high set cheekbones, eyes set deep in the eye sockets. He was hailing and farewelling Satan before he went off to Disneyland, if he remembered uh, what happened to him in court. Jason Moss was a pen pal of his. Now, what some of, I mentioned earlier these astral rape toys, serial rape toys. What they can do is they can get to know you just, by, just on the internet. They can exchange an email or two with you, but they, by so doing, they forge the psychic link with you, and they can immediately start coming into your dreamscape, S rape you, sodomize you, just terrify you, and, various and sundry ways. Well, uh, Jason Moss was writing him letters, thereby forging that psychic bond. Pretty soon, he started coming into Jason Moss's dreamscape, bending him over, trying to strangle him. I think he probably tried to do more than that. But it just shows you that what I've described has been independently described by others. Okay? He has that ability to astrally leave his body and try to assault somebody who he's only been in pen pal contact with. This is like, you know, before, I don't know if they have emails anyway, but it was just through letter writing that um, Jason Moss had maintained communications with this guy. Personally, I'd say get a life. It's this crazy, crazy hobby. Ted Bundy, okay. Here's a, here's a good picture. Pronounced uh, uh, brow over his um, eyebrows, high set cheekbones. He used to like m many uh, 
serial murderers, either into ligature, you know, strangling, or they're into blunt force trauma to the skull. He was both of these. He liked to um, try to have intercourse with his victims and strangle them and watch the life go out of their eyes. That turned him on, the moment of them dying while he was trying to have intercourse with them. He would actually come back to the dump sites where the bodies were months or years later and, and uh, sexually gratify himself over the decomposed skull or the skulls of his victims. Okay. Again, it's like, it's inhuman. It's, it's just appalling. That's precisely my point. It's inhuman. To ascribe his behavior uh, merely as some kind of psychological aberration or disorder is way off the mark. Well, I'm running out of time here. How much time do I got? Seven minutes. Well, I'm supposed to leave you with a feel-good thing at the, at the end so you don't leave here with indigestion. So I never got around to talk about my lab shoot. Well, if you, if you want to talk to me out there um, sometime before I leave, uh, feel free to, to talk to me because I have a lot of information about military abductees. Uh, in, in short, they are used as um, multitask platforms by the deep black elements of the military. Because they are, many of them are uh, hybrids themselves, reptilian hybrids, but also, you know, the greys and the mantis beings and other um, ET races have been tampering with the genetics of all these people. They've developed these innate abilities. Sometimes they don't even know they have these abilities. And one quick thing about hosting is a person isn't necessarily hosted by a reptilian. Uh, the mantis beings, the greys, can also host people. Uh, sometimes a troll-like looking demon entity can, can host people. So it, it varies. And not only that, though, but some people, we call them a collective. They can be hosted by multiple entities, which is very confusing to a psychic, because one moment they look over, and the gal sitting there, and there's a reptile overshadowing her. Ten minutes later, the guy, psychic looks over, and now it's a mantis being. Okay? So again, these people have a genetic predisposition, uh, which allows them to be a uh, host for these various entities. Okay, now how does this all tie together with the reptilian overlordship and the New World Order? Well, some of you are probably familiar with David Icke's work. Uh, long before David Icke arrived on the scene, shape-shifting had been described by, by abductees. Uh, very often, uh, reptilians in particular would assume the guise of other aliens, very often blonde Nordic type aliens. Um, sometimes they would appear as tall greys wearing robes. Other times, reptilians would appear as uh, military personnel. So the concept of shape-shifting has been well established in, in the abduction literature long before David Icke popped up. Now, how does this all tie in? Well, once again, through the uh, control of the human gene pool, the reptilians on a family scale and on a macro scale have ensured that their reptilian human hybrids, some of them with quite you know, advanced psychic abilities have attained positions of power, not necessarily up front publicly, but in positions of power throughout all strata of society. And we see the, the bitter fruits of this all around us. Uh, we are one more false flag tango operation, as they say, from watching this whole country go to hell in a handbasket. Uh, we are very close. So this is a reptilian agenda. It's not just power-mad, power-hungry human beings. And here's my, my thought I'd like to leave you. Uh, Barbara Bartholik was trained by a master hypnoth hypnotherapist named Dr. Curtis Reeves. Dr. Curtis Reeves had uh, trained uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, and doctors around the world in, in uh, hypnotherapy. And Barbara learned from him. Long before Chet Snow, Dr. Curtis Reeves uh, did what he called future progressions. You've all heard of past life progressions, but he actually would uh, hypnotize somebody and then progress them into a future uh, incarnation. Now, those of you that are fundamentally inclined, you can just you know, tune this out. But um, for those of you that are open to this, in case after case uh, that Dr. Reeves worked with in these future progressions, what the individual described as a future society was a place where there was no more laughter, 
people were trained and educated and intelligent enough just to operate computers. The air was so polluted, they all lived in dome cities. There was no more spontaneity, no more individuality, no more, not even any more laughter. And in case after case after case of these future progressions, this outcome always came up. Now, what I'd like to suggest to you is that needn't be our fate. What's been described as planetary confinement is, is part of the control mechanism. These deep black uh, aerospace agencies have hoarded this alien technology for decades. I mean, we're still pumping gas into primitive combustion-driven dr engines. How pathetic is that? Now, what I see is a small percentage of the surface population, a small percentage, mostly my lab people because they have the, the, the capabilities to pull this off. I believe in one or two generations, uh, some of our descendants will not only regain our per total personal sovereignty and freedom, but we will eventually get off this rock. Our destiny is in the cosmos. But there has to be a sp parallel spiritual development. We cannot just obtain the technology and go off into the cosmos because without that spiritual foundation, then we'll become the abductors. Then we'll go around genetically manipulating with, with native populations on different worlds. I believe it's our destiny not only to go out into the cosmos, and why should this sound any more crazier than every, everything else has happened up till now? Think about it, okay? Not only is it our destiny to leave this rock, but to go out into the cosmos and to help other uh, civilizations that are subject of this sort of predation that I've been describing today. I believe it's our destiny to go around as the white knights of the universe to prevent what's going on here from happening elsewhere. So I'd just like to leave you out of thought. Thank you for, it, for listening patiently. I really appreciate it. I've heard people um, suggest that there's the, the bad reptiles and there's also the good ones. Have you heard of that or do you think that's disinfo? Yes, yes. Um, I only focus on the really negative ETs because they're the ones causing all the problems. Likewise for the reptilians. However, from some of the my labs that I know, they are, there are what we refer to as messengers where reptilian beings will appear to uh, certain abductees, frequently my labs, and impart some message. Very often, unfortunately, it's a cryptic, obscure message that you know we have to scratch our heads and try to figure out. But very often, this happens to certain certain my labs. Um, and sometimes it seems that the the reptilians that appear like this, they actually I don't know if it's for effect or they're just pretending, but sometimes they they really act in a way that they are sorry that the person has to go through all these things. So I've heard that there are some reptilians that, if not outright hostile, are at least benign. Okay, we got another question over here. Okay. Um, since during your talk you really had to gloss and almost skip over the MyLab uh, area, could you uh, expand a little bit on that and give us a little background on exactly what a MyLab is and so forth? A MyLab stands for Military uh, Abductee. It's a term coined by Dr. Helmut Lammer of Austria. Now, unfortunately, Dr. Lammer believes that whenever uh, a MyLab describes seeing aliens, it's the result of some drug-induced mind control. Okay? But what characterizes a MyLab is that a MyLab is a legitimate alien abductee first, who then becomes embroiled in this deep black military program where their physical and innate paraphysical abilities are utilized. And they are utilized as covert operatives. Some, it depends on the aptitude of the individual. Some person could be used as like a chemist or as a, as, a, as a scientist in an underground lab. Very often the military controllers will either verbally tell the person straight up or mind control them into uh, taking uh, courses which allow them to become like first responders, like um, EMTs, paramedics, firefighters. I don't want to blow the cover all the people out there that are firefighters, EMTs, and paramedics that are actually my labs. But you see, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a pragmatism involved. The deep black military controllers are loath to lose 
these people they've mind controlled and utilized for so long. Many my labs have been trained and given virtual reality training scenarios where they're supposed to try to escape from a, a, an apocalyptic scenario on the surface, either all-out nuclear war, germ warfare, uh, some natural calamity, missile attack, whatever the case may be. Many, many my labs have been trained to, in escape and evasion. Um, they've been trained in weapons, what have you. So, uh, in fact, I know one MyLab woman, her two daughters are also in this program, and the military has told her she has to, uh, when the time comes, make her youngest daughter dress up and appear as a boy. That way it'll keep the kid from getting kidnapped because it appears that the military controllers foresee a time in this country where what's going on in southeastern Europe, Ukraine, elsewhere, where thousands, hundreds of thousands of of women and children are being rounded up and sold off as sex slaves, they foresee a time when that's going to happen here. And so they, they're, they're, they're loath to see these people that they've been training. They're not doing it for altruistic reasons. They don't want their assets messed with. Now, it seems to me that since these sex slavery rings are also after little boys, I don't know how good or effective disguising her little girl into a little boy will be. Okay? But they're also used as multitask platforms. For example, satellites have inherent limitations. An overhead imagery satellite is launched out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. It goes into a polar orbit, and um, they wait you know, for that part of the Earth to um, uh, spin beneath it. It's not like in the movies where they can just send these overhead imagery satellites everywhere. They have to just wait till the part of the Earth rotates beneath them before they can start the imagery. Well, my labs that I refer to as astral operators they don't have such limitations. They can be sent anywhere, astrally, um, underground, above ground. For example, one of the female my labs that I know, she was frequently sent into the tunnels um, around Afghan in Afghanistan. Now they knew precisely where to send them <laughs> because it was the Saudi bin Laden group on behalf of the CIA that was building all these tunnels in Afghanistan uh, during you know the, the Soviet occupation. So they would send these astral operators into these tunnels, and then they they identify that they, the military controller handling the astral operator through some kind of means, some kind of link. They boost their their thoughts directly into the uh, the my lab, uh, and the my lab will report back. Yeah, I see several people here, and next thing you know, um, earth penetrating ordnance comes in and just kills all the people that were in these tunnels. Now, what they probably do to doctor the source of the intel is that, you know, through channels, they make it seem as if um, the intel came from somewhere else, not from my labs. And so a strike aircraft is sent out. They you know, deploy some earth-penetrating ordnance, and they kill those people. And well, they're there watching this explosion, and they're not harmed at all. In fact, the my lab controller has to tell them, you won't get hurt. Just, just, just tell us what you're seeing, you know, report back, and whammo, you know, ordnance comes in, wipes them out. Now, there's another type of astral operator. Uh, in surface military ops, you have what are known as um, command and control ships. It's not unusual for like a command and control in a helicopter or airborne platform to be relaying uh, instructions to ground uh, personnel uh, and serve as a comm link between you know, headquarters and, and wherever and the troops on the ground. Well, astral operators are utilized in the same way. There could be one astral operator that the military controller is talking and working through, and that astral operator is psychically linked with a number of other astral operators searching all these tunnels all at once. So um, they've developed that capability. And the people that are telling me these stories are, I mean, you would see them in a supermarket, and you would think nothing of them. You would just think housewife, right? But, I mean, they, and these are people that Candy Turner called UFO virgins. They don't go to conferences. They don't listen to George Norrie. They don't read UFO books, okay? So there's none of this contamination you always hear about. One, the military is also, and I'm only talking about a particular military program. There are a number of military MyLab programs running in parallel. And although some of the training techniques and operations are similar, okay, because all branches of the service, Army, Navy, Air Force, uh, they control MyLabs. One of the things that they've managed to do is Within the, the psychic field of the, mile, uh, the astral operator, they've created um, this grid system where the, uh, the, the astral operator is floating above 
say some village in Afghanistan or um, Iraq where some other innocent people are about to be wiped out. Um, by, a co by a coded designation grid system, the MyLab can adjust fire, say like artillery fire or, or ordinances coming in. Uh, the astral operator can report back to her controller, no, it needs to go to G3 or whatever that square in the grid is. So in the field of vision of the astral operator, the military can literally create like a, a grid um, screen, which they use to coordinate and, and direct fire, which is really no different than the forward observer would for strike aircraft or for artillery, it's just a psychic way of doing it. Some of them are. And what's interesting is some my labs are given, I don't want to say a wide degree of latitude, but some of them are allowed to walk around these underground installations basically unmolested. You know, um, it's very common for a my lab to wake up and find himself in a clinical type setting, lab coat personnel with a clipboard, nurses, medical personnel looking over them. Sometimes they, can, they get up and walk around the facility and they see military person. Very often they see other my labs walking around in smocks, you know, um, um, hospital gowns. Sometimes my labs will describe being in tunnel systems, underground installations, and tram systems underground where the place is just teeming with other my labs, where they're all just like herded along, all zombied out and mind controlled. Some with more uh, awareness than others. Some retain an astonishing degree of awareness my labs do compared to others. Okay. And then they'll find they'll be herded onto trams and sent off to this place or that place. Also, I believe what happens is it's not only a physical thing. I believe that astrally many of these MyLabs are taken in these mass MyLab settings, but they're really in astral form. I think that it's done to familiarize themselves, uh, familiarize them with the, the installations. Uh, you see, our astral bodies are just as real as our physical bodies. I had an experience where there was this, this ET uh, entity. It was so comical that the image this entity presented. It was a short uh, grayish looking entity with a rumpled face and I, I kid you not, it had like a nurse's hat on and, and it had a crooked wig. Corny as it sounds, it's true. And I was um, laying on this table and it was just like I was in a doctor's office. Uh, and um, the, I was fussing. I, I didn't want this entity to mess with me, right? So it, it, it grabbed me in a place which I don't mention in order to subdue me. And then the moment I calmed down from that, it boff, uh, injection right in my upper left bicep. And, and I remember getting off the table, walking outside of the clinic, and then I remember feeling, I remember feeling the puncture wound on my left bicep with my index finger. It was real. Then the phone starts ringing in my bedroom, and I'm thinking, okay. I'm over in this other place feeling this puncture wound in my index finger, and yet the phone is ringing. So I'm either in two places at once or something weird is happening. So I woke up, answered the phone, it was an abductee friend of mine. Now the long and the short of it was, there was no longer any puncture wound on my left bicep, but the pain still lingered as if I really was injected. So that tells me that these entities, and also, what, what abductees will describe is their astral bodies are taken out, medically experimented on. It's all density, frequency, and vibration. Remember, Tesla said with resonance, everything is possible. These entities, various entities, apparently understand this to a degree that boggles our mind. But anyway, uh, these people will be taken astrally out of their bodies, medically experimented on, and in the same places their astral bodies were experimented on, they wake up with bruises on their physical bodies. So. You know, I don't even try to explain that. I just know that it happens. So the point I'm making is the deep black elements of the military know that humans have this ethereal astral capability, and they utilize them as these astral operators, for lack of a better term. I had another question related exactly to that. Um, I understand there's um, government research along these lines in, in being able to extract a person's soul from their body, you know, kind of like to create a zombie or whatnot, but that they actually, they, they, they've created some kind of electromagnetic containment or something, and they're able to contain a soul in a container. Cage. Yeah, some kind of Faraday cage. 
that retain the consciousness or the soul matrix. And so do you think there's any relation to those kinds of things in relation to my labs? Of course, the whole mind control thing is one thing, but, but just in terms of the so-called secret government's soul research and, and what they plan on doing with that. That's what's troubling. I know that the deep black elements of the military have always strived to duplicate the capabilities of the aliens. Now, we know from discussions with many abductees that certain ET groups, the Greys and the Reptilians, have the ability, if you read the Ted Rice story, Ted Rice was another protege of Barbara Bartholix. Uh, he describes being abducted, being given, he was a child at the time, uh, given a potion to drink and then basically killed him. And, what the, and when he was in the process of dying, the, the entity somehow transferred his consciousness into a black box. They, they hooked up these wires from the black box to, to his body, made him drink this thing, basically killed him, and then they somehow pulled his consciousness into this black box. They then brought in a clone body of himself, and then they transferred that consciousness, his consciousness, into the clone body. And then, as a um, byproduct of that, all of the one-time childhood diseases you're only supposed to get once, uh, chicken pox, what have you, he came down with them again. Okay. So what year was that about? He, I, this is when Ted Rice was a kid. He's in his 50s now, so probably like in the 50s or the 60s or something. But uh, in fact, his family was there when he was returned. He was returned by what appeared to be a tornado with all these lights coming out of it, and, and then suddenly there he was when they'd been looking for him for hours. Okay, but um, the militaries always strive to duplicate the technology and the capabilities of the aliens. So I'm sure in their own demented way, the deep black military is trying to do exactly what you're, try you're describing. Because you have to remember, these people aren't restrained by like, things like morals or scruples or, or what's right or what's wrong. I have to laugh when I hear people say, well, we have laws against human cloning. It'll never be done. Is that going to stop deep black elements of the military, intelligence community, who have already done ex radiation experiments and all horrendous things to people? Yes, uh, you know, we have this awareness that we have these operatives around us, and uh, so we can identify them. Uh, is resistance futile? No, that's kind of like the thing I, I finished up my talk with. I think that my labs are probably the best suited to survive the coming cataclysms because they've been trained to. I mean, some of the female my labs I know, you don't want to cross them. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're just pretty hardcore. But... Um, What's, what's happening is uh, a lot of these my labs are also, they, you have to understand that they go through guilt trips. I mean, if, if they have a clear memory of, call, of helping to call in artillery fire to wipe out people in a village, I mean, there's some my labs that are proud of that. There's some my labs of the fact that, yeah, I get to kill people, I'm, I'm an assassin. But there's many others who don't like how, how they're being used. They just don't have a choice in the matter. I don't know if I answered your question, but... Oh no, that, that, that's about it. Yeah, thank you for um, thank you for sticking around. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I'd like to get a hold of some of the other ones too. Uh, yeah. I haven't we'll seen any of them. Oh, I can give you my my.